Revelation chapter 4 this morning, Revelation chapter 4. We're in part two of praise to the Almighty, the King of creation. Praise to the Almighty, the King of creation. Let us read our text in Revelation chapter 4. It's the whole chapter actually, and we will uh, uh, take the second part and uh, finish that today. And we want to really, I really want to emphasize that we really focus today on the holiness of of God, how holy and perfect and untainted and no sin, and he wants us to do the same thing. Now, we can't do it totally, but we can surely work hard at being holy, getting the sin, getting all of that stuff out of our lives, and we want to focus on that and focus on his holiness and his greatness and this glorious holy scene in heaven. Revelation chapter 4, beginning... In verse number one, after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and sardin stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf or an ox. And the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Now notice uh, in verse number 8, we have a hymn. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy. Holy, Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. And here's another hymn saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Let us pray. Father, we thank You and we give You praise for this powerful chapter. Uh, here in Revelation chapter 4, we ask for uh, Your help and direction as we uh, look at it this morning. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill me now for the message. Uh, we would see Jesus high and lifted up. We want to see him in his holiness and his power. And uh, it's just astounding that the vision uh, that you gave John of heaven, glorious, what a, a, an awesome place. And uh, we ask uh, that you would direct our steps as we uh, consider this passage today. Uh, may it thrill our hearts, may it prick our hearts, may it uh, push us in, in the directions that we need to go. Uh, uh, may we see the holiness of our Savior today. So we're looking to you, lead, guide, and direct in this time. And we ask this in the holy name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Last week we looked at point number one, praise God, because He is the King over all. All things. Verse 1 to 5, we had four subpoints A to D. A was the plan of God demands our praise. 
B, the person of God demands our praise. C, the privileges of God demand our praise. And the power of God demands our praise. Today we pick it up with points number two and three. Point number two, praise God because he is holy in his nature. So we saw in point number one, we emphasized the kingship. Now we're seeing the holiness of our awesome God. Holiness so defines the character of God that it can be said to include all of the other divine moral perfections as well. Holiness is the, in the absolute sense, belongs only to God, since only God is untouched by evil. To say that God is holy means that he is separate and he is different from all other beings and from everything that is evil. Holiness means that God, being without sin, has absolute moral perfection. His holiness is primarily about separation and transcendence. Separation, he is set apart from sin and transcendence. He is above all things. The idea behind the concept of holiness is that word separation. It comes from a word meaning to separate or cut off. There are two aspects to God's holiness. First, God is separate or different from all other beings. He is unique. He is one of a kind. There is none else. He has no like. There is no equal. Second, God is separate or cut off from everything that is sinful and evil. When we say God is holy... We call attention to the profound difference between our God and all other creatures, including humans, demons, angels, all of it. It refers to God's transcendent majesty, his august superiority, by virtue of which he is worthy of our honor, our reverence, and our worship. That is a little synopsis of the holiness of God. John continues now in the chapter to unfold his throne room experience. What he shares right now is both magnificent and it is strange. However, John's point is as crystal clear as the sea of glass that he now Behold, subpoint A this morning, his creatures show his holiness. His creatures show his holiness. We find this in verses 6, 7, and 8. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf or an ox. And the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and, the rest, and they rest not day and night, saying, and here's the hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come, or is coming. He is coming. John sees something like a sea of glass, similar to crystal, before the throne. This adds to the amazing splendor of the vision he has. Maybe this represents purity and the lack of any need for cleansing in heaven. There is no need for cleansing of any kind in heaven. You think about your house. You think about what are you doing, especially you ladies, and maybe some of you, you husbands are help out. 
But I'll tell you what, keeping that place clean is an all-week affair. I mean, I've been doing a lot of extras since my wife's uh, uh, wrist has been broken, and I'm getting a real understanding of what that wife goes through. And I'll tell you what, I appreciate it because, you know, uh, in the evening I'm so happy and so thrilled. Everything is spick and span. The whole kitchen is beautiful. And by the time we get to supper the next day, it's a total disaster once again. And it has to be all clean. Uh, there is none of this in heaven. No cleansing. No cleaning. It's just one super awesome place. There is no need. Uh, maybe it stands for God's transcendence and his holiness. That it is a sea of glass may pick up on the fact that the sea is usually negative imagery when we read about it in Scripture, as a place that is wild and untamed. Uh, the Lord Jesus went walking on, on the sea, and it was wild, and the, the disciples were scared for their lives. The sea was wild. But here, here in heaven, it has clearly been tamed, appearing like glass, clear as crystal. And then John sees these Four strange living creatures covered with eyes. So the first one we read was like a lion, and the second was like a calf or an ox. The third had the face of a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. In addition to being covered with eyes, they each had six wings. Six, not two. These are angelic beings of worship who have the characteristics both of Isaiah's seraphim that we read last time in Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel's cherubim in Ezekiel chapter 1, 5 to 25 and chapter 10, 1 to 22. I'm going to go back to Ezekiel and, and just read a, a few uh, of these verses in chapter 1, and uh, we are going to see a, a similar view of heaven and, and what is happening here. Uh, he ends up, verse number 1, And I saw visions of God in the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity. The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buri, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the river Chebar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And, and I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and the brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the colors of amber, out of the midst of the fire, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And every one had four faces, and every one had four wings, and their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass, and they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not uh, wh where they went. Uh, they went every one straight forward as for the likeness of their faces they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side and they four had the face of an ox on the left side they four also had the face of an eagle almost that same thing just the the, the glorious picture of heaven that these creatures are full of eyes all around, eyeballs, that would, that drive me nuts. It's bad enough to have two eyeballs staring at you, but these don't miss a thing. Full of eyes, emphasizing God's omniscience, his exhaustive knowledge of all that is or ever could be. And the wings suggest the speed to carry out the will of God. 
We cannot be dogmatic about the appearance of these four creatures, but we can suggest some truths that God may be communicating to us. First, God is perfect in his authority. The lion is king of the animal world. It emphasizes strength and honor, that which is noble and respected. Second, God is perfect in his activity. The calf or the ox is a servant. It exercises great power for the benefit of others. It was the mightiest among the domesticated animals. Third, God is perfect in his majesty. Man is the pinnacle of his creation. And only man has a face in this vision. He is intelligent and rational and spiritual. He is the apex of all that God has created. He is God's vice regent on the earth. Fourth, God is perfect in his deity. The eagle soars in the heavens and often represents deity. It is the mightiest among the birds and the swiftest of God's creatures. These creatures are strong like a lion. They serve like an ox. They see like a man and they are swift like an eagle. Each in its particular appearance gives witness to the greatness and the glory of our God. No creature is as strong as our God. No creature serves as does our God. No creature sees as does our God. And no creature is as swift as he is. Uh, once in a while you get to see an eagle marvelous, marvelous, bald-headed eagles, just marvelous. And, uh, and even just to see them on a video and, and see what they can do and, and those, those claws. <laughs> that poor fish didn't know what was coming. I mean, they're so fast. They just, they're just what an amazing creature. So we're looking at his creature's show his holiness. Now let her be his creatures tell of his holiness. Adrian Rogers called the four living creatures God's cheerleaders. I like that. That's what they do. They cheerlead for God. Awesome. While the meaning of their appearance may be unclear, their activity is not. They never stop. They're doing the hymn all the time. They're singing that hymn all the time. They're cheering day and night. They never sleep. What are their words? Isaiah 6 tells us what they said. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. They ceaselessly cheer the holiness of God. They call attention to the infinite holiness of our awesome God. The living creatures celebrate God's holiness and power of the past, of the present, and the future. Such holiness cannot tolerate the presence of evil. So there's a good point when you're dealing with someone who is lost and they think that they will stand before God and they will uh, give their list of the good deeds that they have done or whatever they're going to be talking about. This one thing alone kicks them out. They are sinners and God cannot tolerate sin, cannot have it. His holiness says, I cannot tolerate that. I'm going to run to uh, chapter 21 just for a moment. Uh, and one verse there, 27. Revelation 21 and verse number 27. And there shall in 
no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. If, if people would just read the Bible. You know, a, a lost person, and I've heard many testimonies, if they would just tick, pick the Bible up and just start reading in Genesis 1-1 and keep on reading, you know what? Before they get out of Deuteronomy, they're going to be converted. Think of that guy that can't think of his name right now, but uh, he set out to disprove God. And th th this is a bunch of baloney. Well, he was saved not too far into Genesis. The Bible works. It's powerful. We see these creatures and we see the, the holiness that they sing about in their hymns. This hymn is the first of many hymns sung by the heavenly choirs in chapter 4, 5, and other places. I'm going to rattle them off. And I went through uh, my Bible in Revelation and I wrote the word hymn every time a hymn happens in the book of Revelation. So we have a hymn in chapter 4, verses 8 and 11. Chapter 5, verses 9, 10, 12, and 13. Chapter 7, verses 12, 15 to 17. Chapter 11, verses 15, 17, and 18. Chapter 12, verses 10 to 12. Chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. Chapter 16, verses 5 to 7. Chapter 18, verses 2 to 8. And chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. A lot of hymns being sung in the book of Revelation. It's astounding. I had never seen that before. In these two chapters, the sequence of hymns shows that the first two are addressed to God, the next two to the Lamb, and the last one to both. Point number three. Praise God because he created everything that exists. Praise God because he created everything that exists. So point number one, we praise God because he is the king. Point number two, praise God because he is holy. And point three now, praise God because he created everything that exists verses 9 through 11 and when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one seated on the throne, which is always and forever the redeemed, the 24 elders, worship. And how do they worship? They fall down and cast their crowns before the throne. When I worked for Sherwin Williams in between uh, Lebanon and Washington, uh, at, at 3 o'clock in the morning during my lunch break, I'd turn on uh, the radio, and I listened to a preacher, and I don't remember who he is, but I remember one thing. Uh, he was talking about the holiness of God and bowing down before him. And the Hebrew word was shakah. And I never forgot it. Bow down, knees to the ground, forehead to the ground. Shakah, that's how the Hebrews worshipped. And that's how a lot of people in the Middle East 
worship. They fall down. These redeemed, these representatives of the redeemed, these elders, fall down and cast their crowns before the throne. What he gave them, they joyfully give back. They did not earn it. They did not merit it. Nothing they have would they withhold from the one on the throne who is majestic, awesome, and holy. This brings deep conviction and raises a question. Am I, are you, withholding anything from God? Is there anything in your life that you are holding back from God, even good things, time, service, money, a pure heart. Chuck Swindoll is right. I don't agree with him on everything, but he nailed this one. Quote, we miss it when our focus becomes horizontal, riveted on people and things rather than vertical, centered on God and God alone. We have to be so careful as the children of God that we don't start worshiping on the horizontal, that we don't start worshiping men or, or ladies or, or people that we think are really great and all of that. Uh, the problem is so many of these people that are worshiped have fallen. And we had a recent fall that happened as well. And so as believers, we must be very, very careful to worship God and God alone and focus on his holiness and striving to be holy like he is holy. Personally, this study has done an awful lot for me. Now I realize I'm standing here, you're getting this for the first time. I got this five, six, seven times this week, and it really impacted me, the holiness of God. The holiness of God to me has been motivation to be holy because he is holy. Get that wicked stuff out. Be holy because he is holy. God alone is it. Let her be. Tell him you believe he is worthy of your worship. Tell him that you believe he is worthy of your worship. Our passage ends with a glorious and majestic hymn, praising God as the creator, falling down and casting their crowns before the throne in worship the 24 elders now sing a hymn to our almighty creator thou art worthy o lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created the first words of the hymn thou art worthy. These were words that the people used to greet their emperor when he came down the street in his procession, his triumphal procession after a victory over the enemy. Only the one who sits on the heavenly throne is worthy. None of those emperors are worthy. None of the great people who have ever lived are worthy. The claim to give them worthiness is blasphemous. If you're here this morning and you are breathing air, and I know that you are, God still has a plan for your life. That alone is worth praising our God for. He has a plan for your life. It doesn't matter how old, how young, where we are, who we are, what we've done, what we haven't done. God has a plan for our life. Last week we ended 
with the hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. It found its inspiration in Revelation chapter 4. It was written in 1826 by Reginald Heber, a bishop in the Church of England. And its words provide a fitting conclusion to this chapter. Holy, 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 Lord, God, Almighty. A.W. Tozer, who lived 1897 to 1963, preacher in the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church, born in Pennsylvania, saved in Ohio. <laughs> he was on his way home from work. He worked at a tire company. And he walked by a street preacher. And he heard the gospel. And when he got home, he went to the attic of the house and fell on his face and believed in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not worshiping A.W. Tozer. I read his story. I dug into his life this week. He had some... We all have our issues. You know. You know what my issues are better than I do. Okay? But he had a couple things that he said. He also wrote that book, Pursuit of God... Uh, I'm sure some of you out there have read it. That made him a household name across America. He, he ministered until he died. Never quit. I want to give you two things that he said that I want to note. And I want you to think carefully that these statements were made either the year he died, 1963, or before that. Okay? All right. First thing he said... Worship is the missing jewel in modern evangelicalism. Worship is the missing jewel in modern evangelism, evangelicalism. In 1963, I was five years old. <laughs> I think you all can remember, a lot of you can remember that. And you know that the church was a lot different than a lot of it is today. We need to get a grip on the holiness of our God. Now let me ask you this question. What do you think A.W. Tozer would say today if he walked in here and gave us a little talk? <laughs> what do you think he would have to say about worship today? The second thing he said, <clears throat> the church is on a dangerous course toward compromise with worldly concerns. The church is on a dangerous course toward compromising with worldly concerns. Again, what would he say today? We've come a long way since 1963. This is my final thought. This morning, might a glimpse of the God of Revelation chapter 4 help us to rediscover that jewel of worship? Let me say it again. Might a glimpse of the God of Revelation chapter 4 help us rediscover that jewel of worship, a focus on the holiness of God will help us tremendously. I hope it will help you like it has helped me. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the eternal word of God. We have dissected a little bit Revelation chapter 4 in two weeks. We have seen the majesty and the grandeur and the awesomeness of our God of heaven, amazing worshiping creatures with great symbolism. 
We have seen your holiness. Father, would you help us as your children here today, help us to be holy as you are holy. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.